The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of paid sponsors. Episode 177 of the Drive-By Podcast with Pantelis is sponsored by Les Delis Lafrenet. Five great Montreal locations, including the hub in St. Leonard, my home location on the South Shore, Tashro Boulevard in Brossard, the newly expanded store. Check them out. The best cakes, pastries, and bakery items, including groceries on the South Shore. It's a great place now to shop for Italian products. It's Les Delis Lafrenet. Make a reservation now at Baton Rouge by checking out their website at batonrouge.ca. 29 locations, including a brand new one coming to La Salle very soon. My personal favorite, their signature ribs. It's just incredible, mouthwatery. And, of course, their signature hamburger. Everything is signature because it's so good, and that's what they're known for, the spinach dip as an appy. It's Baton Rouge Grill House and Bar. This is the drive-by with Freeway Frank. Pantelis is finally <laughs> here. here for three hours. And it's not like he's been uh, doing some stand-up, solo stand-up in front of me, and that's why I'm laughing. I'm laughing because I almost came this close to not press. I'm a one-man show here, Pantelis, and I came this close to not pressing record on your camera, and I just hear Pantelis go, Phew. <laughs> Is this is this uh, is that one recording? That one is recording. Do you see a little red dot on top of my head? I do, but I just thought it was Excellent. a cultural thing. The thing, first of all, welcome to the Drive By Podcast. I, I I love the fact that you're here. I was on your podcast about a month ago, and you're finally here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Because you are the, and I'm not blowing steam up your. Um, you're, how do you say uh, asshole in Greek? Kolotripa. Kolotripa, yeah, I forgot that word. I went out with the Greek girl for five years, so I knew so some know. of the words. Kolot- Kolotripa, I kind of remember. but uh, remember the important, for, stuff. <laughs> the important stuff. I don't want to do that, but you are uh, one of the pioneers of Quebec and Canadian podcasting. You started way before anyone started doing podcasting. When people were, especially in my business, former business of radio, people were like, the fuck is podcast no one knew what the hell a podcast was you were doing it yeah radio people told me what the fuck are you doing this it was radio people except for me i never said that the truth is you never did no you never you you were on the even though i hated all you radio guys (laughs) you said that on the podcast on your podcast yeah yeah, you were you i found out later too speaking to people who would listen to you a lot you were one of the guys that people like because no, no no he says what he really it's not i i saw all you guys as part of that system but then for, when I spoke to Terry DeMont, I found out how he got fired. And then I realized, I go, okay, it's not everyone. Like, people actually wanted to do real radio. Yes. Yeah. You included. Thank you. And you guys got fucked over. Yeah, I appreciate it. And so, I, you know, I like the fact that you said that because there are two different breeds of radio broadcasters. And I'm sure now that everybody has jumped on or is still jumping on the podcast bandwagon, there are two different breeds of podcasters as well. People who naturally like yourself wanted to start a, a podcast. You're, you're a stand-up comic. You probably, I think you told me on your podcast, you wanted to do radio, but you know nobody gave you a shot on the radio. Yeah. Hearing and listening to your podcast now, watching your podcast, you would have been great for where radio should have gone. I would have been in that circle too. Yeah. We need more people like Pantelis, or we needed more. Now it's over. We know that. It's dead. On the radio, because you're just you. You're not trying to hide your ethnicity, who you are, what you do. You are you, and you don't change for anybody. And I think that's why you've become a successful podcaster. And I commend you for that, because you've been doing it for how many? You said now 12 years? Now I've been doing it for, what are we, 2024? 20, 14 years. That is incredible. 14. Yeah. That's, that's insane. Yeah, it is. So what got you? Okay, so how do you start podcasting? I know that Joe Rogan was the GOAT pioneer in America. Yeah, he started around 2008. Okay. And I always loved uh, Joe Rogan, and it was a good idea. What happened to me was I was always, uh, like, I liked doing stuff with my friends. We did uh, videos. We did a lot of comedy stuff. I was in theater. I I had an artistic side. I need an outlet. And we tried to film a pilot. Uh, it was called Prelude to Insanity. I remember me, my friend, my buddy <laughs> Phil, who be, it went on to become a filmmaker. And it just, I spent, we got all our money together. I spent every dollar I had at the time, which wasn't a lot anyway. And it sucked. We put it together. It sucked. And we're like, all right, we're not going anywhere with this. you know. And YouTube wasn't as big. Like there was not, 
there wasn't a lot of places to go at that time with that if no one wanted to pick up this pilot. So it wasn't made as well as it should have. We didn't have the experience we needed. And then it, I, I just felt like we needed another outlet. And I was getting into podcasting. I was listening for a couple of years. And I was like, you know what? I think we could just podcast. We just hang out together. And we're, we're, we got fun stories. We like to talk. We, we all love like talk radio. And I would listen to a lot of uh, Opie and Anthony when I was working. I used to work at EA, Electronic Arts. And in the day, when I'm working on the computer, I would always have them in my headphones. A so, legendary morning show. Legendary. Yeah. Legendary. That I had influenced. And they were, uh, you know, they were mostly up against Howard Stern. Yeah. So it was interesting times. I, I was, a, I was a Stern guy at the time. Well, I, I'm, I'm more uh, of an Opie and Anthony at the time, but I respect, like Stern changed everything for everyone. Yeah. So if you don't respect him and you don't like kind of respect what he did, then you don't respect the media. Exactly. Really. He changed it for everyone. Yeah. So I got a mic, a Logitech mic. I remember I could afford one. It was like 50 bucks and it was for one person and it was garbage. And now we're four or five people around to talking. <laughs> we started in October of 2010. That's and, wild, man. That's, yeah. That seems like a lifetime ago. We it, started with two listeners. And then I remember a few months later, there was 12 listeners and we thought that was cool. Yeah. And then when my buddy Alex started doing a couple of live shows on Saturdays, there were four hour live streams on, I forgot what it was called. The, we called the show Underground Propaganda and it was us and you could call in too through Skype. So we had people calling in. So it started to kind of snowball, get more. I remember after a couple of months, we had a hundred listeners like every week. Then it, you know, it was just, it was like, this is crazy. Then after about a hundred episodes, everyone got busy. They were doing their stuff. They stopped. I went solo. I started the Pantels podcast in 2013. And then that started, it was when podcast people started taking more serious. And uh, then Two Drink Minimum in uh, 2018 with Mike Ward. And now uh, I have the French cast. Uh, I produce other people's podcasts. There's the intellectuals. There's, with there's uh, Guido of, and with Poseidon. Guido and Poseidon, yeah. two great guys. Yeah. Interesting so, guys. <laughs> very, very interesting guys. Very. You interesting find guys. them all. You find all the interesting. There's another one now too. There's Adam, which is Guido's longtime friend, who's the weirdest one. He's the most screwed up of all the intellectuals. And he's been co-hosting for a couple of weeks now okay. with Poseidon. And it's just people don't know whether to be excited or angry at his stupidity. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. <laughs> but you find all these people. I'm a magnet. You, I have to say you are a magnet, but I have to say you seem like, at least to me, the most normal because comedians, are, let's be honest, yeah. and I have a lot of comedian friends. Something went wrong in the childhood of <laughs> most of these comedians. And that's why they're so eccentric. I have rarely met a comedian who is not eccentric and out there. You seem uh, like a very, very normal guy, and you don't. But seem I'm like not normal. That's the thing. I'm not normal. I didn't have a normal childhood either. I think the difference is like I learned how to work. So uh, the main difference I noticed with my comedian friends is I can't get them to be consistent in working. They'll wake up at 1 p.m. They'll get so I have that. No, no, I gotta handle my shit. You I, have structure. I have structure. That's basically because yeah. I guess I worked in the corporate world for so many years. That's what I have. But I'm a, obviously I'm a lunatic. You know, most people wouldn't. Most people don't say what they think. So for me to just keep yeah. doing that, there's obviously a problem. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like I'm willing. I'll, I'll take the biggest risks. Yeah. Just because I want to say something. Yeah, I noticed that. I mean, you say <laughs> you definitely say what's on your mind, which is the reason why when I was turned on to you somebody mentioned your podcast and i started to to listen and watch mostly listen because i'm an audio guy having come from from radio most podcast listeners are audio yes and that's where yes you want to yeah. hit before youtube youtube is is hard harder a lot harder we know that but there's no point to watch something if the substance isn't visual correct yeah, yeah. and the content is is there then you could enjoy it I'll as go. theater of the mind, like old time radio. I like it. Which is the reason why I think you're, you're so good at what you do. And then you figured out a couple of things. And that's doing multiple podcasts, doing, I think your most successful one, I know Two Drink Minimum is successful, but your French cast, it's called, I think? Huge. Huge. Yeah, it was nominated for an Olivier last year. That, that's <laughs> incredible. Okay, so French is your third language. I guess, technically. You, on paper, it's technically my first. If you because look at you my went to French, records, yeah, you went to French school. Long maternelle français. Okay, because you never got the luxury like myself. My older sister went to English school, right? So you didn't have, and I was from a generation just older than you, one over than you. So I automatically got to go to English school. Or they did your parents, that's what I'm saying, they wouldn't let you in. My mother technically went when she was in Toronto before they came to Montreal, before I was born. Okay. She went to a college in Toronto in English. But it didn't count because it had to be in Montreal at the time. So I had to go to French school. But I was already in French school since elementary anyway. So mm -hmm. in high school, there was a decision made. And I went with my friends to a French school. But even at that, it wasn't like, oh, my God, what's he going to do? Because I was already in the system. 
You know, it was a Greek, French, and English school at the base, and French was the most important language uh, from kindergarten. So it wasn't a shock for me. It's just that I have a weird accent that no one else in my family, like my sister, who's older than me, <laughs> doesn't speak French the way I speak French. Yeah, you have that Greek mixed in with English and park acts mixed yeah. with everything you know the same way italians have the italian accent english and then they start speaking french and it's like what are we listening to but only if for some phil uh some uh, he he had a very good way of describing it he goes it's because you're not it doesn't it's not an anglo speaking french it's you're speaking greek in french <laughs> for some but you don't speak greek in english in english you speak english yeah in greek you speak greek but for some reason when you speak french yeah. it's a greek guy trying to speak it, french. it's exactly I'm an Italian guy trying to speak French. It's, 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 it's the exact same thing. So then you meet, I mean, obviously when you met Mike Ward, he has to be a mentor to you as well. Yeah. He's fantastic. Doesn't he have the number one podcast in the country? I think the by French. Far. He by has far. The number one French language comedy podcast on the planet. On the planet. That we live on. I don't know about other planets. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty wild when you sell out the Bell Center to do a podcast. You were there that night as well. Oh, I yeah. was there. Yeah. yeah, you were there. Yeah. And I was there and I was there. Um, I that, cried. Yeah. It's, uh, this I cried is, when he was going out. It was so emotional because in my head it was uh, like I couldn't control it because we were right where he's going out. Um, it, it's it's you know right like where the players come out dressing room, yeah. And it was kind of they were doing a hype video and showing all the years and just I was thinking in my head about everything he went through for a decade and all for just free speech in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have to. He could he could have pussied out, been like fuck, it, I'll just give thirty G's. Why would I spend th over three hundred G's? But because of the principle, and he's like, other comics are not going to have the means to fight this, so I have to. So just seeing all that come to the Bell Center, it, it got all the way there where it became the biggest podcast. He broke a Guinness record that night and he's helped me so much in my life and my career. He became like the best friend I ever had and yeah, I got emotional. So I was like, and then I saw a camera in front of me because they were doing a documentary and I was trying to hide my face. I was like, oh my God, I feel like such a pussy. I'm like such a pussy. <laughs> but I could, you, know, you know the moments where you just can't control, like it just came. I was like, why am I crying? Yeah, which says yeah. a lot about you. That I can't control my emotions? <laughs> no, that, yeah. If you can't control your emotions, don't play poker, don't gamble, <laughs> because you'll get a lot of those. But no, that, that it was a special moment to you, for you, and you realize your friendship with him, and look how far you've come. Oh, you know? I love it. He's my best friend. I yeah. love him. Like, I, I'll do anything for him. And he stood for, I've had him on my morning show at, at Virgin Radio, and one of the things I noticed that morning when he came on, and I, that was one of the mornings when you have guests like Mike Ward, that you're like, oh, I wish I didn't do top 40. I wish I didn't have three minutes. Yeah. Because you wouldn't believe the amount of time we'd have comedians come on and they tell me, Frank, three minutes. I go, Th three minutes like per segment? No, three minutes. Total. It was horrible. And I would try to always, I'd get in trouble after because I'd, I'd always make it longer, eight minutes, 10 minutes. I, I, can't, I think, but that's the problem with that medium. Is imagine you have, getting in trouble for creating good content. Exactly. And Mike, especially at the time with the lawsuit and everything Huge. that was going on, and that's what got him, uh, propelled him to being on Rogan, mm -hmm. which I think then took him next level, right? And you were there for it because yeah. you're not only his friend, you're his uh, partner in crime, right? Yeah. You're, you're partners, you're equals. He seems to me like he treats you like a 100% equal. 100%, but me, the big thing about him is his generosity. Like he's, dude, he's the nicest guy you're ever gonna fucking meet. It's not even comparable. That's what I gather. He helps from, so many yeah. fucking people. Yeah. And for me, he's the one who, he, he won't admit it because he always says, no, it's you because you work hard and this and that. But he's the one who gave me a legitimate career because he opened a lot of doors for me. And he also, anytime I had a question and I wasn't sure because things were getting a bit too big, for me i would go to him and right away he'd have the real answer he doesn't pussyfoot around it he he like lets you spread your wings even in french he's the one who pushed me to do it french and then it exploded in french and uh, after his tour ended noir because i was one of the openers for him he said the nicest thing on the last show he goes i'm very happy that you you live this and he goes and what i thought in the beginning for you and preach because me and preacher there he's like you're the perfect people to to do this with me because i felt like this is what you guys needed to see quebec go out do your and then you guys are going to start doing your own thing. And he was like proud of us like for doing our own thing because I have my own hour in French. And, and it, but it all came from him. He's the one who gave me... The reins, basically. He, and yeah, said, Take he, it. He, yeah. He, he trusted me. Because imagine, I'm not speaking French. I haven't spoken French in years. And he's like, all right, uh, come open for me in a fucking theater. There's a couple thousand people here and they're going to see you. And I was like, what the fuck? So he, he knew, like he, he has confidence in you and he doesn't like it if you don't have confidence in yourself if he has. So he pushes. He's like, no, no, I know what I know. And he... he Everything he was all he was there to, to mentor me. Questions he was the only guy that understood. Like I never had to explain myself to him if for a joke. 
Never. He, we had the same sense of humor. So he knew where I was going, and it still continues. That's why Two Drink Minimum is so much fun. We'll just stare at each other, and we know where we want to take it to, to yeah. fuck with someone. So it's just, he's the greatest dude ever. It's wild to think what you, you guys have created and where you are now. So for people that listen to watch the Drive-By podcast who have no idea, because some people are podcast listeners, some people came from my radio background followed me over and there's so many more that I have no clue I'm doing this. Right? I met some of them. <laughs> I'm at some of them. All yeah. two of them. <laughs> at uh, my jewelry uh, store that I go to. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there. Big fan of yours. She loves you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But but what you got... Okay, here's the thing. So I go to Pantelis, Pantelis's... Is that the way you say it? Pantelis's... I guess. ...studio. Yes. And you're over... Uh, where my mom actually worked for many years, but now it's become this cool hip area. If you're if you're not watching or listening to this from Montreal, it's called the Chambonel Garment District. Yeah, you have a, many studios within your enterprise. Okay, yeah. you walk in, and it says you know Pantelis podcast, a two drink minimum. There's so many other pod, the intellectuals, um, the French cast. It's all set up perfectly. Every studio works as its own entity. The reason why I'm saying this, it's all technical bullshit that Pantelis was trying to teach me before because we had a buzz in our, in our headphones and he was telling me he learned so much technical behind the scenes. But you have this big production going and this space. The thing that amazes me and I'm sure has amazed people like Ted Bird and Terry DeMonte, whose podcast I'm going on in a few weeks. Yeah, I've been at invited. the studio. Yes, at yeah. the studio again. And the thing that must... It doesn't shock me because I've been a Rogan fan for a long time. I've, I've followed you guys for a long time. I know what you guys are up to. But when I walk in there, and I have my studio here, but when I walk in there, I'm like, okay. So radio, still trying to hang on to what they're doing. Television, trying to hang on. YouTube, we know where they're, they're at. Audio uh, mediums and platforms like Spotify, Apple are taken over if they haven't already right yeah. it's like people say you got to start a podcast no you should have started a podcast yesterday but you walk into this thing and i'm just trying to describe it and you the feeling you get when you walk into a radio station in in 2024 i know because i walked into radio stations all my life is not the same feeling you got when you walked into a radio station in 1994 or even in 2010. It's somber now. It's somber. It's like... And the feeling you get when you walk into this creative space at the Pantelis podcast is... I can't explain it. It's, it's this new medium, right? This new platform. And it's like, wait, this guy like Joe Rogan in the United States and all over the world, has put together this space the same way a media corporation would. But the only difference is the media corporation's <laughs> going like this, and they're trying to figure it out, but they're not really because it's been 20 years of decline. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And then I walk in, and you got this guy, right, Pantelis, and he has... Some his, random his, Greeks. Yeah, it's some random... <laughs> did you just say random Greeks? A random Greekster, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Greekster. And and you got Poseidon, who's a Paisan as well, and, and you have Mike Ward and, and all these other personalities there. What I'm getting at with this, it's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. And if people are still not in tune with what's going on, where are you? Because this is not only the future, it was yesterday and the day before. And to see somebody like you do this and start it, because you literally, like you said, you bought a microphone for 50 bucks to bring it to where you brought it. I fully, man, honestly, I commend you because you paved the way for so many people and you're so nice. And it's exciting. That's why this excites me. Even though I'm a one-man show, I love the fact that you could come on here, we could sit down, have a conversation, and nobody's telling me, Frank Pantelis, three minutes. Oh. And, and so you're your own boss. I'm yeah. my own boss. And it's just wild. It's just wild like that you have your own studio and you've got to this level. So I commend you. Uh, thank you very much. It was hard, though. It, it, it was hard. It, it was, still is hard. It still is yeah. hard, but I mean, it was hard. Sometimes I'll sit back with my buddies who I used to podcast with, and they'll mention that because it was in my buddy uh, Homer and Alex. It was in their basement that we started podcasting. Like, well, isn't it crazy that we were in a basement and no one took anything we did serious? <laughs> and now you have these fucking studios, sponsors. You're going to different cities. Like, it's, so, it's so absurd. It's, uh, it's, it's a wild to think. Yeah. It's wild to think that... You know, you have a building, a brick and mortar. I mean, you have a brick and mortar too, but my point is you have how many people working there? Uh, 
three, four people yeah. working for you. But they, you got brick and mortars that are radio stations and TV stations with still, you know, the ones that have survived the cuts. Hundreds of people working in and all this office space and all. And you're like, what? And, but then there's no content going on. And there's they're no, sad. I've been for interviews, even yeah. in, and you walk in the radio station now, and it's, it used to be exciting when you're younger. Use, of course. And then now I walk yeah. in, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? What is going on? And then yours, you walk in. This is what I'm saying. Even when you walk into a space like this, yeah, it's happy. And it's only happening. you and I. It's like we're free. Yeah, it's freedom. That's what it is. It's freedom. And and the same thing you mentioned about Mike Ward and him fighting for freedom of speech for so many of us. And this is what we have, right? No matter what the space is, if you're thinking of starting a podcast, please don't. There's so many saturated. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. Yeah, but if you do, it's like... about podcasts, because if you have beauty. a niche, it yeah. doesn't matter. You could create... Anything. You can have the best pie podcast, yeah. and you'll find people that are pie enthusiasts. That's the good thing about podcasts. Yeah. You don't have to do the same thing as someone else. And I keep telling, is it too late? But you know how you're talking about companies not getting it? It's funny, because uh, just for laughs, I've been trying to get them to start their own podcast label for years. For years, and it, they just, it wouldn't, I feel like they didn't, un, the heads of Just Last didn't really understand what podcast, they know that there's podcasts, they know that podcasts are popular, but they never understood the culture around podcasting. And I even had a meeting a few weeks before they announced the bankruptcy. And I was trying to tell them, we're in there, we're sitting, and I was trying to explain to them, like, no, we need a, like an idea. I go, it's not an idea, you start a network and you could do many podcasts, but you have to start to get started. And I was trying to explain how there's money and I would help them get audio ads and all that stuff. And it was going over their heads. And then I realized it's just... You can't force it. You, some people, like the old media, old, they just don't understand why there's money in it, how it works, what makes a good podcast. They think there needs to be like some kind of an angle and a spectacle. It's not. No. This is what makes a podcast. There's no angle. There's no angle. <laughs> that's, the, that's the angle. Yeah. That's, the, that's exactly it. So I realized in that meeting, I go, okay, it's just not for everyone. You can't. Uh, I'm not a, a monk so I can try to convert people into new medium, you know? Mm -hmm. They don't like it, they don't like it. And then a few weeks later when they announced the bankruptcies, I was like, ah, well, like, uh, I hate that that happened. But goddamn, that shows that it was probably other angles too that they weren't taking to be future-proof, mm -hmm. you know, to move into, the, you can't use the old model. No. Everything's changed. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, I mean, radio had an opportunity. I bring radio up all the time because I worked in it for 30 years. Radio had an opportunity, Pantelis, in around the turn of the century, 2000, 2001, would change, you know, to change with the times. The same way that Netflix came aboard and Blockbuster, I think Netflix approached Blockbuster and they were like, ha, losers, right? Yeah. They had an opportunity to work, let's say, with people at some point, with people like you. They didn't. And then now they're literally scrambling. I know because I know everyone across the country in the business. I've worked everywhere. And it's a scramble now. And it's a panic what the fuck do we do now? And it's cuts, 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 cuts. And I think all those cuts will eventually lead to the complete demise and collapse of the business. But what took them so long to figure it out? They still haven't. They still haven't. And the thing that you, Mike used to have a good fucking story about this. Uh, the radio, regular radio, when serious satellite radio was coming out, they were so stupid they didn't take it serious that they were they're like, no one's gonna pay for satellite radio, no one's gonna pay for radio. That they were allowing on terrestrial radio, they were doing ads about how shit radio is and you should just go to satellite. They were taking the money like this is never gonna fly, they're just wasting it. They were literally signing <laughs> over promotion. Yeah, they were signing their death certificate. They're yeah. like, now we're gonna it they were so dumb, so short sighted, you know, they don't go with the wave. A lot of times you have to mm -hmm. let go and go with yeah, just the flow and see what's happening. It's like saying right now, um, I remember businesses had this problem. I remember there was one, I'm not going to name them, but on Park Avenue, where the this was in the 2000s. I'm like, you need a website. And like, the, that thing's going to blow over. I'm like, the internet is not going to blow over. That's where everything's, <laughs> that's crazy what you're saying. Yeah. That's not one of those things that blows over. It's not a fad. You need it. It's a new, yeah. it's a new utility, basically. Yeah. So some people just don't. They think if I plant my feet and don't move, the world's going to stop with me. The world keeps moving. Absolutely. And yeah. leaves you behind. Yep. You know, I had somebody... And I respect everybody, you know, well, most people, that told me at the beginning, right before I did episode one, and this is episode 177, so we've gotten somewhere, that I would never be able to sell this podcast, and I said, and I or hang on to sponsors, and I said, with longevity, and with content, and with great guests, and conversation, and freedom to say what you want to say, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a certain type of of sponsor or client that will find it too risky, you know, to advertise with Pantelis or yeah. Freeway Frank based on the fact that 
these guys are could say anything you, yeah. at any point. But you don't need those uh, but, sponsors anyway. There's but, a lot more. Right, but yeah. you don't need those. But I do appreciate the fact that the ones that have jumped on board with me that are still, you know, well-known brands are willing to give it a chance, right? But then long-term, as you build your audience, there are so many other sponsors as well who really don't care. Right, that are on there that'll just like they just care about the fact that you have an audience downloads streams yeah. whatever and they want to support you and they're out there so i think we've come to a point in this business it's it's not even a crossroads because i think you see what the numbers where podcasting is where where podcasting has become mainstream legacy is what i used to do as in old and decrepit because they never change with the times you know we see that it's they have been left behind. So people that are joining us every day are seeing that we care about them and we are honest. We talk about what we want to talk about and I think that's what will keep moving this machine forward and I think that's how people like you here in Quebec and in Canada, Mike Ward, uh, people like me are trying to do and other personalities that are doing podcasting now and guys like Joe Rogan the innovators and the 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 goats mm -hmm. are bringing in the numbers that they're bringing in. I think he's at what eleven million downloads per episode, uh, something like that. Maybe Is that a little more now. More, yeah. okay, because yeah, he's got uh, access to more. Because they changed it now, he's no longer exclusive to Spotify, right. so he's going to be everywhere. So it's just more downloads. So now he's everywhere else. So since his latest Spotify deal, yeah. which is wild. One of the cool things is you ended up on. You were, was he in Austin when you were on the podcast or no, still no, in California? No, it was the first one. It was in uh, so, LA. It was still in California. Yeah. Okay. So that was cool. Yeah, Being, that, that was, was what, cool. five years ago, six years ago? Yeah, 20, it was October, of, October, November, I think November of 2018. Yeah. So that must be, I, I would say, a definite career highlight that yeah, you're that was, cause sitting. Because I, I love the guy. Yeah, so, he's amazing. And you're sitting next to Mike Ward. Yeah. How was that whole thing? Experience I, was very, I was very nervous. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was a weird, it was a weird experience at first too because when we showed up, like he didn't know who I was obviously. Yeah. So he's like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> uh, so it, it was, but then getting on when we started the show, I was like nervous and he gave me like, um, he told me, he's like, here, uh, smoke this, but I don't smoke weed, but it's Joe Rogan offering you. So I'm like, I got to smoke this. So I took so a So wait, huge you smoke. never smoke weed? Very rare. Oh, very, boy. Very rarely. <laughs> so then I take a huge, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He goes, calm down. He goes, this isn't the stuff you have in Canada. This is strong. And literally, he was correct because I started to think weird. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm starting to lose it a bit. So then when the podcast starts, you notice, for like the first hour, I'm a little like this, like a little out there because I, I was like, don't say anything stupid. Don't look at millions of people are watching. Don't, they, don't say anything stupid. But then it started to wear off, and I got, I became myself. I didn't notice, honestly. I just thought you looked very excited. I was know? excited, yeah. but I was also like, don't say anything stupid, yeah. you know? <laughs> so we had that. and it, But it was a fun experience. It was just cool being there. And then I took from him, like I, I had never seen a studio at the time that was that big because he had a lot of space. So it kind of, in my head, I was like, oh, fuck, when I build my own studio, and it turned out to be years later uh, when I went to Chabanel, I go, I'm going to do the same thing for mine. I want space. I want long tables. Uh, it, it made it so much more comfortable mm -hmm. to just have that space, you know? And I liked what he did. So I took a lot of stuff, but I learned a lot being there. It was such a fun experience. For me, it was a career uh, changer because that kind of legitimizes you. So it used to be uh, like late night credits used to be what matters. But now for all the real comedy fans, all the real comedy bookers, it's all the big podcasts or festivals. So within the same year, I had done Just for Laughs. I had, we had went to New York. We had done uh, the Jim, Jim and Sam uh, in the morning. Ron Bennington, which Bennington is like one of the greatest radio broadcasters, Ron and Fest at the time. Uh, and then Rogan two months later. So I got to do everything. And I was on Kumia when it was still Artie and... and uh, and Kumi, even though Artie didn't show up that day. Um, so all the people that I used to listen to and I used to admire, within a few months, I got to do all their shows. And it was, it was, it was surreal. It was, one of those, um, it was one of those times where you're like, fuck, is it a simulation? Like, this is too weird. Yeah. One We're in the Matrix. Another, this is too good. Yeah, one after <laughs> another, is, is, it was very yeah. But, you know, you lived it. And then uh, I'm not one to rest on my lowers. I just used that as a stepping stone for something else and yeah. just continued. You have a lot going on here in, uh, in Montreal and in Canada. But more and more comics are moving. I may have heard, I heard him say something along these lines. I don't know if he said he was moving or thinking about moving or definitely moving to Austin. But uh, Ben Bankis? Oh, maybe. I, I don't just know. Heard, I watch his videos. He's a fellow comedian yeah. from Toronto. And I could have sworn I heard him this week say he's moving to, to Austin. 
A lot of comics. Well, a lot was, of people are moving to Austin. That's where Joe Rogan is based. But Joe, once again, the innovator, he was there. And then now everybody seems to be flocking there, almost like he's David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. A he is. He is. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> and I get it because uh, I go down to Texas. I was in Dallas doing shows about uh, in January. And I was supposed to go down uh, to Austin, too, to go do his, his club. The mothership. Yeah, ship. but yeah. Uh, me and Adam, like, I, I, I fucked up the dates that I told him. And then... Uh, Whatever, I had to come back home, but I said, I'll go to Austin to perform there when I get a chance. But I get it because when I was there, it's a different country, man. It, it, I, I really like Texas. Texas is fucking nice. Texas is nice. It's free. I see it. I've never been, good. but yeah. I get why people want to move there. Plus, in Austin, he created... Uh, this is why Rogan, it reminds me a lot of Mike, because apparently, uh, you have to, the, the comics that get booked at the mothership, he pays them well for regular spots. I hear that. I hear he's a very good guy. He's a very generous dude. The reason why he pays them well is because he loves comedy. He loves comics. He knows how hard it is for comics. So he goes, fuck. I'm not, as long as everything's paid, like let's say the club is running, everyone has a paycheck. This it's not. He's not under. The, the club's making money. He's like, what the fuck? They're gonna, I'm going to pay them better. They're able to start their careers. They're able to pay their rent. They're able to focus on fucking comedy. They don't have to do side hustles that'll piss them off. He's um, contributing to the culture of comedy. And, like, he thinks a bit further ahead. He's like, I'm just going to help the type of people I love, which mm -hmm. is comics, nurture that. And the club, for everyone who's been there, like uh, Chris Ramsey goes down a lot. Uh, he's another co-host on uh, Two Drink Minimum. Uh, and he's like, dude, it's fucking, what he's built there is literally the mecca of comedy. Mm -hmm. He makes them all comfortable. It's good comedy. No one gets canceled for fucking jokes. Yep. Everyone's so, allowed to, to come there and do their sets, and it's pretty amazing. So I get it. Like, yeah. I, I, I just, Dallas alone, which is, f which is not a, like the Austin scene, was fun, and I like the people there. So I'm imagining what's happening in Austin right now is probably amazing. Right. Yeah, I've thought about it. I've, many times I've been like, fuck, sure. I was going to ask you that. Like, would you ever consider it? Yeah, yeah, but I'm again, considering it. You have something great here. That's the but, only thing. Yeah. My French is here, but maybe a half-half or something, because yeah. I really am tired of the, the government here. Uh, oh, okay, let's get into that. But I am. <laughs> I, I'm getting really, really tired. Like, I see a lot of stuff that's happening, and uh, I have come more... I've come to terms with people not understanding... Because someone says, you know, um, they told me you can't change. If someone doesn't have like an IQ level to realize that they're getting fucked with, there's nothing you could do to convince them. No. So I know sarcasm, apparently the line is 85. It's an IQ of 85. If you don't get sarcasm, you just don't get it. And you don't understand hypotheticals. Uh, it, it means that you're hovering around 85. So you're not going to get more complicated stuff. So I learned this about, I didn't know. I only learned recently that it's IQ related. A lot of comedy. So, so you're saying this province is low IQ. <laughs> it's, it's the whole country. The whole it's country. A, well, but I don't know if it's really the whole country or what they show us in the media. Because when I talk to people, they're all against what's happening. Yes. They get it. But then online, it would seem like the way they talk. We did these fucking polls and everyone agrees with Trudeau. And it's like, no, they, who wants to give away their money? Les Delis Lafrenet, five Montreal locations, including my home location in Brossard on the South Shore. They've got everything. I'm always there. I practically live there. I, I live close by, but then I practically live in store because they have so many great Italian products. The most awesome deli counter on the South Shore. Great coffee. Go by and say hi to Anthony. Say hi to Julie, Shania, the whole crew working at a great location. Les Delis Lafrenet in the South Shore. Check them out. Also, five other Montreal locations in total. St. Leonard, Rosemere, Point Claire, Montreal West, and of course in Brossard. It's Les Delis Lafrenet. Simplement délicieux. Baton Rouge Grill House and Bar. Just around the corner from here, very close, is the downtown Montreal location. Newly expanded and renovated. If you're going to see a show at Place des Arts, or anywhere, maybe going to see the uh, the Habs at the Bell Center and you want some great ribs, hamburgers, or appies, happy hour, sans cassette, right before the game or after work with your friends, check out the Complex des Jardins location on St. Catherine in the heart of downtown Montreal. Plus, it's 29 locations, brand new one coming to LaSalle, number 30. Check out all the locations and the closest one to you. Find out at batonrouge.ca. It's Baton Rouge Grill House. And bar. It's bizarre that, like you said, there's so many people you speak to that seem to have above average IQ who get it. But then the elections come around and we vote in the same people over and over again. And a guy like Trudeau ends up being in, in, in power for eight years. A guy that like Francois Legault gets in, he gets voted back in, even though Trudeau's a minority. But 
how does this keep happening? That's and, and and then you're thinking, so it has to be low IQ or and we get complacent. They get yeah. they get scared. Or Plus, that. Yeah. it becomes um, a tribal. It's no longer about what's good for you. It's about that's my team. Yes. And that's what I hate. Like when people say never liberal or never conservative or never, you can't say that. I agree with you. Because if someone is yeah. good, like let's say if Trudeau drops out and there's a new uh, leader of the Liberal Party who's just amazing and has different views, mm-hmm. what are you telling me that if you voted conservative before, you can't vote for that? That's so yeah. stupid. You it's vote true. for the, the, the people that are more in line with your interests. Mm-hmm. Right now, Trudeau's not in line with anyone except for his buddies with the World Economic Forum, all the rich people. He's definitely with these death cultists he's going right whatever they want he's doing and he this is the other thing about trudeau i could tell from his speech he legitimately thinks he's doing well absolutely he said well because he's delusional and he's he's a sociopath so he's that might be it i haven't tested him but it might be that (laughs) because you don't have to test because last week he said something crazy they told him like you know last week you mean in the last hour no no but last week he said something that i was shocked i go these people are all morons he said so he's bringing in the new carbon taxes people already don't have money uh provinces are like we're not gonna fucking add this this is crazy they don't have money people are suffering we can't keep fucking up their pockets the economy and then he's like all the stuff i'm doing you're going to find out in a couple of decades that I was right. The next few generations, he said. Dude, yeah. Yeah. he's destroyed this country. Yeah. They're, they're going to try to assassinate you if you're still alive in a couple of days. It's crazy. You're making sure that the kids that are working now can never own a home. How are they going to thank you? But Because in his head, he goes by the World Economic Forum. We don't need to own anything. We're going to make it so unaffordable. Yeah. You're going to own nothing. You're going to be happy. happy. We're going to yeah. take care of you. So in his head, he's like, I'm, I'm furthering the agenda of my homies. He doesn't get that the people that, like, let's say Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab, have you read this book? I haven't read the book, but I'm familiar with, I've read enough to know that yeah, I got it, who yeah, he is. On Amazon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all, it's ideological stuff yeah. of clearly of someone who never lived a real life. It was just, he has an idea of how the world should be. This weird utopia of there's the elites because we're smarter. And you don't, oh, we'll take care of everything. Mm-hmm. Just fucking sit and don't breed too much. So uh, reading like the way he sees the future, it's very anti-human. It's all this. And these, these are the people who don't like humanity, who want less people, who don't like cultures. That's the other thing is they push weird integration where they go, you got to let everyone in here, everyone there, but they hate culture. They want to mm-hmm. dilute it. So there is no culture. They want to dilute it. So... Uh, Greeks, Indians, that we don't actually exist with our culture. We exist within the corporate country. So mm-hmm. Canada becomes... Yeah, we assimilate. Yeah, it just it. becomes faceless. And it's not even a Canadian identity. They nope. just want a consumer identity. Mm-hmm. And then it, I see young people, like movements where they think, LGBTQ movements, where they think we're anti-establishment. Uh, but it's the establishment that's pushing this. It's super... For, they just want you to be against everything that's really against the government because they just want you to they're like we're with you so you could just toe the line and be it's we're getting brainwashed like fucking crazy it is it is wild what's going on and the, we, we finally uh, met well not finally met somebody who may hate and i know that's a strong word hate dislike trudeau more than i do because i go on killer rants and when we met we met pentelis and i or we we fell for each other <laughs> <laughs> on that level because it's like well you hate trudeau as much as i do frank this guy is the, his smugness we talked about this on your on your podcast his smugness his fakeness it's, it's there's super, nothing authentic about when he speaks but let me tell you what he does about the separation so this is what he does with with groups so we all we all want to belong to something right so we fall into groups so let's say right now we have um like we have the greek community obviously but if you go for like subsex now we have people tie in either a political party they're into mm-hmm. uh if you're lgbtq plus you have your group uh there was the black lives matter thing so what they do is they want you to join a group so you feel separate from the other person so everything that happens is an attack so then you're more like get the government involved to stop that person yes which is the craziest fucking thing because the way you're supposed to if you want a good society is i shouldn't care whether you're greek black brown gay straight if the second it matters to me if i'm going to treat you differently like let's say right now you tell me you know what pentels i'm gay if i'm like fuck this guy (laughs) then i'm the fucking problem i shouldn't be separating you from these in into these groups these groups shouldn't matter that's your thing I should embrace the fact that you're you, yeah. right? But what they do is they separate us, and then we wonder why everyone's fighting and nobody gets along. That's why. Because they told you you're fucking different. You're not fucking different. Everyone has their own fucking thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, everyone has their own fucking thing. That's the beauty of humanity. They've meticulously orchestrated this, like you said. They're, They've meticulously... The plan they is... They made you angry because yeah. your neighbor's Muslim, gay, Greek, yeah. or whatever. Why would you be angry? Because yeah. you're fucking... It's another human being. 
Who would like it's so stupid? And then people fall into the traps like, oh, he's with me because I'm X thing, and he said that X thing he's for, and all. And mm-hmm. they trick you, they put you into these fucking groups. Yeah. Because together, we're unshakable. Together, dude, what is the government gonna do if everybody gets together? I'm like, no, 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 fuck off. Yeah. Don't get involved in people's personal lives. That's another thing. I don't know how we talk about people's how the government has the right to talk about like private shit. Get out of there, bro. Handle the economy. Don't destroy it. Handle the military. Leave society to society. Leave it to human beings to dictate. Mm-hmm. So we could be calm. But they try to separate because it's easier to rule that way. Yep. Everyone's fighting, so everyone's asking for the government to help them. Everyone's distracted and, and against each other. He's yeah. polarized our society so much. Like any, I don't remember, even his father wasn't well liked in the West, especially, and then even here in Quebec by the separatists and all that. But I don't remember a politician, a, a person in Canada disliked as much as Justin Trudeau. It's unbelievable to me that he is still at the, uh, you know, at the lead of the Liberal Party and Prime Minister by now in the past. They would have pushed him out. But the veil is starting to slip because... We've been saying that for years. No, no, I, agree, I mean, people are noticing. We noticed well, a noticed. bit earlier. Yeah, but people, a lot of, by the way, never vo- I never voted for him. Back I voted 20- for him once the okay, first time. I never voted. I'm being honest. Though. I used to tell Natasha on the air, on Virgin Radio, I used to tell Natasha, I will never vote for this guy. He's scum. I could tell he was living in BC when I was doing radio in BC. I never liked him. I never, I, I, could, I could sense the smugness even back then when he was younger. Was never a fan, never voted for him. I voted for Stephen Harper. But when he came in, you know, like a wrecking ball, literally, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But it was all, all oh, the looks, the JFK of Canada and yeah. all this. And look at now where we are after. He's no years. JFK. He's no JFK. Not even close. No. But, sorry, you were saying about his... Oh, I voted for him the voted, first time. Because yeah. I was like, oh, I was younger too. I was like, oh, we need a change. It's good to get somebody. I, I felt a little. I felt his smugness. But I was like, you know what? If they can make a change, it'll be good. And I didn't really appreciate what Harper had done for the country. Because I didn't like Harper because very, I'm very anti-war. So I remember in high school protesting the Iraq war and all that. So in and, and my view, I, saw, like, I only saw that stuff. Like I didn't see the economic side of it and what he did. So I didn't appreciate it at all. And then it didn't take Trudeau long to lose me. It was very early on. In well, his, now he's pro-war. No, oh, yeah, they're all pro. That's so what I found liberals out. Liberals have become pro-war. Yeah, they war. all trick yeah, me. Yeah, but because <laughs> that's my big thing is I'm fucking super anti-war. Mm-hmm. It's the dumbest. Well, uh, I, I agree with you. I'm very, very anti-war. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. So anyways, he had said early on. He goes. They asked him a question about the the budget because he inherited a surplus and it was the healthiest Canada's ever been. And he goes, uh, man, you're kind of promising a lot of stupid shit, and you're. It doesn't look like you're going to be able to balance the budget. And he said, oh, the budget's going to balance itself. As I remember soon as that he clip. said that, I was like, oh, fuck, this is going to be rough. But I didn't expect it because, you know, the pandemic happened. I didn't expect it to get this rough. But goddamn, dude, he, he fucked around. He fucked around and we found out. That's the best part about it. He's, and we're the ones paying for it. So, no, there's a lot of problems. But I'm very, very anti-war. And even now, I don't like the fact that we're sending money to the Ukraine repeatedly so we could get Ukrainians slaughtered. Um, there's a lot of, he's just talking about like Israel, Palestine, like, oh, that's not good, but we're still sending drones and we're doing it through Turkey and we're giving Turkey drones too and Turkey's, uh, they're helping with uh, kill the Armenians with Azerbaijan. Canada, when I grew up, was supposed to be the peace country. Go out there. Well, we, like, always, well, had, we always had peacekeepers. Not anymore. Now not we're anymore. funding. Now yeah. we're helping them. We're funding we're making, wars. Yeah. It's, and people don't know. You speak to all people in the street, they don't get it. And We're, we're funding scams. We're funding... The, uh, and the, U, the Ukraine thing really fucking bugs me because people talk about pro-Ukraine, but we're actively allowing Ukrainians to get slaughtered right now because we've already said, and Ukraine said, and we, like, peace is off the table. There's no negotiating. Which with a power like Russia right now, you, you have to sit down and negotiate, especially when we don't want to admit that we've, we s- sacrificed the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. We're the ones who threatened, oh, we're, no, they're going to come into NATO. When he said, well, I'm going to fucking attack them. Mm-hmm. But because we're so far away, we're like, yeah, let's fucking do it. He's not hitting us. But what about those people? What about these villages? What about these, these Ukrainians? People have their families there. We didn't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. They're, 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 they're pawns for us just yep. to fuck with Russia. It's, it's absurd. It's a, if you did that here in, in, like, in your daily life, people would call you a scumbag. Mm-hmm. If you let your neighbor, you know, you're like, yeah, yeah, this, you know, you just, you egged on your other neighbor who's more violent so you could fuck with him. And then you're just giving him weapons yep. while he's getting the shit kicked out of him. It, it would be crazy. Yeah. Well, you just said it there in that phrase, egged on. That's what they do. 
That's what the liberals constantly do. Well, this, to be fair, it wasn't just him. This was yeah. a concerted well, effort with an the American, yeah. the military industrial complex yeah. knows what they're doing. That's how they make all their money. They needed another war. Mm. Same thing with, the, with Israel and Palestine. Yeah. They know what's going on. Mm-hmm. They know what's going on. They're not, they're not going to, they, they're not happy to work something peaceful out. There's also ideologies there that are getting involved and mixed up. So it's, all they care about is selling weapons, making money, yep. and everyone else can go fuck themselves. Mm-hmm. And it helps with an ideology, too, that doesn't want that region to be split anyway. So it works in their benefit. It's crazy. The, so right now, if you bring that up, if you bring up the, like, the war in Ukraine, how we should be looking to stop this and there should be peace and all that, people get mad at you and they go, you know what the fuck you're talking about? You gotta, people get so indoctrinated in the cult, they don't value human life anymore. At all, they don't because because their political leader told them this is good. They're like it's good. What's good about it? Mm-hmm. What's good about kids dying? Do you tell me what's good about that? Mm-hmm. You Nothing. Only, you only no. say that because you. It's fucking people that their family or them they never been through war. They don't know what it is. It's the worst fucking thing. It's the worst fucking thing. Yeah. It's mostly innocent people that die. Even people that get drafted to go to war. The Ukra- Even the Russians, too. Yep. You think they're all they're like, let's fucking kill these Ukrainians. All of them are like, God damn it. Yeah. It's so... It's so yeah, I remember a song by a Canadian group called uh, The Box. I don't know if you're too young to remember. Remember? You don't remember the no. song? And it was called Ordinary People. And it was during the... You know the, the the 80s and the Iron Curtain, Russia, the tensions between Russia, nuclear war, the USSR at the time, and the United States of America. And the lyric in the song said, "We are ordinary people." And it talks about how the Russian soldier feels. Do you think the Russian soldier is not a good guy? Yeah. It's only the American soldier that's it. Well, that Russian soldier probably doesn't want to be in the trenches as much as the American soldiers there, but they've been sent there right by two different countries two different ideologies they're there fighting each other and half the time and i remember my dad used to say this my dad fought not my grandfather my dad fought in world war ii okay he was shot by a german right through his shoulder i was close to never being here sitting across from you and i remember he fought for canada he no no my dad was italian so he fought he he was 19. if he was italian bro he wasn't against the germans uh, uh, sorry? In World War II? Well, in World War II at the end. Okay, when, he when switched Italian, sides. When, Ita- when Italy... But there was a point where he was well, fighting with Hitler. Well, no, no, he wasn't. Uh, no? No, 100%. He because, wasn't Mussolini guy? No, because when, when Italy came, uh, when Italy went on the Allies, joined the, yes. the Allies side, and once they went over, and that's because like, I, I used to ask my dad this, he explained the whole thing. We have the textbooks and the historical yeah. um, information basically explaining when he came aboard he was it was on the ally, ally okay, side they had already switched. he was fighting yes and my dad was 19 like was at the time in 1944 in the month of i think it was april like about april 7th or 8th i remember looking at the dates and he was saying that bullets were flying everywhere and he was fighting alongside Americans. How and, weird and was the, it for the Germans yeah. to have the Italians with them the whole war? And, and then, then all of a like, sudden, right, because they used to call, that's why it, Italians have been called um, a double fly, you know, basically uh, doppio bandiera, which means double side, double. Well, like two faced? Two, two faced or two flags because they started with Mussolini, axis of evil, and then all of a sudden they went over on the other side. But my, anyway, my dad was saying he was, he was fighting alongside Americans who were always trying to take cigarettes from him and the other Italians, and that bullets were literally flying everywhere. Yeah, but and, it's war. And, and he came up, he was, in, he was in a hole, he came up, he saw his shoulder just explode. explode. He said he went down, and that was one of the best moments of his life. And he was only a 19 year old at the time because he knew he was going home. Oh. And as long as <laughs> there was something that he wasn't seeing, but he looked over and he realized that the bullet. Went had, through. Went through. Perfect. Okay. And then he stayed down there. But the whole point that I mentioned this is he said it was the scariest shit. He watched so many of his comrades, so many of his coast, you know, soldiers die out there. So many people die. And why are you there? You're fighting this war for these leaders that have their agendas. Yeah. And literally, these are young kids going, you know. A lot overseas that came over from Canada, uh, ones that came over from uh, the UK, France. He was fighting in the in Northern Italy, but think about that for a second. And you mentioned that it's never good for the people that are going and fight these wars, right? No, Actually, physically, is. they're fighting. It's great for the politicians. 
It's super great for the yeah, politicians. Yeah. It's great for the uh, defense contracts. Yes. Trillions of dollars. Yeah. But I can't, I can't justify, I don't want to kill anyone. I can't justify that killing someone's kid. Se- you have kids sending your kid. It's so stupid. It, and the fact that it's 2024 and we're still talking about it, wh- wh- you know, who are we going to war with next? Is China going to piss us off? Mm-hmm. It's like you're never going to, f- you don't fight China. You don't fight leaders. You know, Biden's not going to war. No. Nope. Fucking Biden's about to die himself, so he's sacrificing all these kids. Same mm-hmm. thing with Trudeau. What the fuck are you doing, bro? We're sending no nego- negotiations off the table. So you're fine with Ukrainian kids dying? You're fine with Russian kids? You're fine with yeah. everyone dying, but not you? Send your kids. If you're that, this is what I say. If you really want, if you're a leader and you're all for any war that you're funding, Lead send by your example. fucking kids. Yeah. Yep. Is he sending his kids there? He's like, no. go defend the Ukraine. No. No? And he never would. He never would. Of course he wouldn't. Yeah. That's what fucking bothers me. Yeah. That's what fucking bothers me. Sit down when we have negotiating power and fucking work for peace. Work for peace, man. This is, uh, I don't want anybody to die. I hate that shit. There's no one that I, there's no culture, no no race, no gender that I, I would want to kill. Like, it's crazy. You only can live once. These, like, why not allow people to live and prosper? They, we've lost the respect for human dignity. And that's the problem with it's socialist ideals that lead that. It's all this communist stuff. Yep. Because there's no respect for the individual. It's all for the for the group. Mm-hmm. And people it's don't like it, talking about yep. it, but that's the truth. You you in a communist society in whatever you want to call it now, the way we're moving into this new neo socialism, you don't matter. No. Nope. You're part of the collective, mm-hmm. which is crazy. You don't owe any. The truth is, you don't owe anything to the collective if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. You the, if someone is trying to force you to do something that you don't want for the, so I, and basically I'm, I'm turning you into a slave you're my slave now because you have to do something for me without you wanting to why you don't have rights over me mm-hmm. I'm allowed to work make my money create my own stuff help people like do, do my own shit I'm not beholden to you it's fucking nonsense what is wild to me and you were mentioning this you, you don't identify as any particular or as to belonging to any particular side. No, somebody, I hate them all. Yeah. If somebody has a good idea and they happen to be liberal, you're, if, if you could relate to what they're saying and like what they're saying, you'll jump on board. Either yeah. way, right wing, left wing. No, I'll go closest to what's more reasonable for me. Yeah. But right now, there, there's no reason. There's no rhyme or no, reason now. No. Especially, just, no. I feel like because I'm becoming more and more of a, like I want people to have more independence. Mm-hmm. So, someone's always trying to take away people's independence, you know? Yeah. So, but even with language now, now it seems like the war is language. You can't say this, you can't say that, which is fucking go fuck yourself. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's not my job to make you feel that's you. You have to take care of your you own have feelings. A problem. Yeah. You take care of your own feelings. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be in charge of your feelings. Yeah. You know how crazy that is. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, did you hire me to take care of your fucking feelings? Yeah. I'll take care of my feelings. You take care of your feelings. Yeah. And people yeah. like Trudeau have created this, cancel culture or at least push it through yeah. their own agendas and like you said they rule their sword is this yeah. right they turn people on each other but so you don't belong to any particular you don't have any particular affiliation I'm, I'm very much the same way i mean look i'm gonna vote there's no doubt in my mind conservative to get to, to oust i, I have Trudeau. no choice now okay? but then i'm worried about two years in when he gets ballsy when millhouse gets all ballsy what's he gonna <laughs> that's why I, I don't trust anybody i don't trust anybody yeah. i don't like having one person with all that power yeah the thing is we do have a parliamentary system so it's it's based you know our electoral system is completely different from the united states united states on a ballot you are voting for that one person yeah here you're voting for a bunch of basically representatives well, you're are, doing the same thing in the states. Well, there is House of, yeah, yeah, House of Congress to, and all that, but but at the same time, it's you know you are voting for it's either Biden or Trump or whoever but, ends up there, depending yeah, on what happens. Let's see what goes on. <laughs> but the, but there are some checks and balances yeah. there that I he, I feel we lose here just because they say it's ceremonial. It's not ceremonial because technically the monarchy still has control. They do it through the governor general. And we say no, but you know, in our lifetime, even Stephen, Har- I think Stephen Harper suspended Parliament twice. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this. I think so. I remember definitely a Prime Minister suspending Parliament. Yes. So I, Trudeau's done it too, obviously. Yeah. But uh, Harper tr- was not during a pandemic. When Harper did it twice, I remember, that's I think one of the reasons why I voted again. It pissed me off so much that nobody cared because no one protested. Mm-hmm. And people will ask, why would we protest that? It's the government. They don't get it. I'll tell you why you should have protested that more than anything. Because you're willing to go out if the Canadians lose and destroy downtown because you're upset that someone lost the game. Okay, that makes you angry. You protest other random shit. The parliament is what we have 
as a representation of our democracy. When someone decides to suspend it, and that's our power, and they decide to suspend it, that means that whenever they want, they can suspend your democratic power. You don't have democracy. So people show up and say, blah, 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 blah. get the fuck out of here. You're paid to be here. We voted for you. Do your fucking job. You're not suspending shit. Mm -hmm. okay? But to suspend it and then be like, all right, that guy decided and we're all cool with it. And then we talk about democracy. What are you fucking idiots? Yeah. Suspend democracy twice. Not to mention Trudeau with the bank account shit and all the stuff that he over fucking stepped with all just because he didn't like people. So, that was a totally different level. Like, but I all would, this stuff, yeah, but whether all, you're right or left, yeah. all this stuff should be unacceptable yeah, in by a the free, people. civilized society. Yeah. But because your team did it, I'm not okay. If a Greek guy murders someone, I'm not going to be okay with it because no. he's a Greek guy. I'm not going to mm -hmm. try to justify it. No. No, I know objectively this is wrong. Mm -hmm. you, and political parties now somehow became teams. But you have to, whatever fucking, if you're conservative, whatever the fuck Milhouse says you have to be with, whatever Trudeau says if you're liberal, you have to be, that's insane. What are you, an idiot? Yeah. You're a free, you're a human being. Yeah. You, stand you're gonna, up for yourself and what you yourself. believe in, yeah. The biggest thing is I feel like we lost reason. Mm -hmm. We should be, we should, our lives should be dictated by reason and logic. And they're not, our, our lives, they change it on us and it's being dictated by emotion. It's all emotion. It's all emotion. Yeah. We were supposed to be the smartest animal <laughs> and we're acting like the dumbest one. Yeah. I'm curious because I have to come and see one of your your, your stand ups yeah, because yeah, I don't fun. know because I don't know what do you talk about this stuff in your yeah, give me an example. Jokes, yeah. Is it a mixture of, of everything or do you It's does, funny. The whole goal is always to be funny. Yeah. Uh, a lot of politics though? No, not no? a lot of politics. No. I don't no. sometimes I'll make a joke. Like I had some jokes about Trudeau at one point. Um, I said them in Ottawa too when I was headlining there at the Yucks. It was fucking funny. Some people got offended in the beginning, but they didn't get. Offended. Somebody always gets offended in this yeah, country. But it's funny because they got mad as if, and I was like, you don't represent the government. Shut the fuck yeah. up. I'm not mad at you, dude. Yeah. So no, I talk about everything. I just like to have a good time. I yeah. uh, I don't look to push buttons. It's just that the stuff I say is gonna piss people mm -hmm. off. But it's all people have a great time. I have a good uh, good reaction. And tell us, have you ever been scared since? You know, Chappelle was attacked on stage. Uh, the whole Will Smith incident. Not that either one of those, you know, Will Smith's going to jump up and start <laughs> decking you. But you ever think when you're making a joke? Mm. Now, you should feel the same way you feel on your podcast or even coming on here. Say what you want to say. As long as it's not hatred, pure hatred, yeah. like you're saying kill people for whatever reason. But do you ever come up on stage and you say something because you are so free? And you have no filter and think to yourself, now somebody starts getting a little bit, you know, mouthy, starts yeah. heckling you because comedians get heckled. Is there ever a part of you that, because you're not a small guy, but ever a part of you that thinks somebody might attack you? Does that ever cross your mind or do oh. you not think that way before you go up on stage? Is not even a thought? I don't, I've never thought about it except for one time. Because I, I don't think about it because, uh, like, everyone's having fun. We're all laughing. Like, cause I, like none of my jokes are out to fuck with people. Not like, fuck you. Like, I don't do that. I want everyone to have a good time. I don't want people to feel weird at my shows. Mm -hmm. I say stuff that makes people happy because I want to be happy and laugh. The only time that it's ever come to my head was um, we did a show. It was a nasty show in French uh, at Juste Pour Rire a few years ago. And um, one of the guys that was on the lineup, my buddy Thomas Levac at the time, he got, he made a joke and he got another comic canceled because he had just mentioned it was kind of like a he's like yeah this guy's like uh, a fucking rapist or whatever he said about the guy and then the guy had done like weird shit to, like he wasn't letting a chick uh, out of the car it was a guy phil bond like he had weird uh, sexual aggression stories around him okay so then that guy got canceled because that clip came out of toma making fun of him so then uh philip B uh, phil bond is the guy's what, name didn't he do radio I have no idea. Maybe I have no idea. I don't even know what he looks like. Okay, I'm just okay. I'm trying to remember what happened. So stuff came out about that guy. Okay. And it became a whole thing. And then people that were fans of that guy started threatening uh, Thomas. So he was on my lineup, and I remember they called me and they asked. Junior the says, "Do you still want him on your lineup?" And I go, "Yeah, why? He's my friend." And he goes, "Oh, because we got some threats. We got some death threats or whatever for him that they're gonna get him. Are you sure you want him on?" I go, "I don't give a fuck. Yeah, he's gonna be it because there's a plot bizarre." So then he's like, okay, what we'll do is we'll have like, just don't tell him so he doesn't get stressed out, but we're going to have like two extra security guys like on the sides in case someone, because they threatened to jump on stage. So it's the only time where I was looking around a lot, but dude, I have Poseidon there. I had all these, like I'm not, if somebody comes on stage, 
they're not leaving the way they came up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Poseidon, your, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Head of one of your, yeah, yeah. Is, and he's, he hosts, uh, co-hosts one of your podcasts yeah. under your umbrella, Pentelis Comedy. So no, I'm not too worried about that, but that was the only time where it had happened, where, but it wasn't for me. It was for someone else. It was, uh, for, but even that I found a lot of people talk, like they'll do something, but you have to be a real idiot to, f- to turn words that bothered you into physical altercation that's the thing where this generation doesn't understand how stupid that line is mm-hmm. we're very quick to physical violence it is you guys don't understand how wasteful and stupid that is it's the dumbest you're not no one's getting out of this alive trust me yeah. <laughs> no one's getting out of this experience of yeah. life alive you're right. all we're, we're all, all headed to the we're same all headed to destination the same. try to make it as happy as you can try yeah. to not be a dick to the people around you yeah. try to forgive try you know don't don't look for uh, the violent reaction right away. It's so stupid. When you're getting booked hmm. at comedy clubs, I know some comedians have told me this. Some have more racy content, some not so racy. I know specific comedians who have been barred from some venues. Yeah, it's fun. Do you have... Like, how does it work? I'm, I've always been curious about this. So your agent would book you, and do they ask questions now more than ever what kind of content Pantelis does? Because there's a specific comedian that I'm thinking, oh, but I don't, I don't want to out him. Yeah, yeah. That has been barred at so many comedy clubs in Canada. He's going to be exclusively, and his popularity has just taken off because of the fact of that, and he's headed to the States to do so You're many things. about days. Ben Bankus? Bankus. Yeah. Because Bankus... Is I mean, look, it's it's definitely it's not for everybody, but if you have an open mind and a sense of humor, I, I find him funny and I and I like what he talks about I've because seen, he puts everything out there. I've seen his stuff. Yeah, he's he's fucking funny. It's not. I a, find him very yeah, funny. He's, yeah, he's and he's on point with a lot of his shit. Exactly. Like, because he's like us, he doesn't have a filter. The, and in him, the only difference is that it's because so many clips are out there. I've probably said crazier shit than him. So is it fair for him to get treated that way? Because if he wants to be a dick, he could be like, yo, Pantel said way worse shit than I did, right? But the clip's not out there. The clip is not available so for is, anyone. Is, is no. that fair? Is that mm-hmm. No, is, but no, he's not being treated. First of all, he's just proving that we don't have something that's so important. Which, freedom of speech is very important. And the only people that have it are Americans. And we don't have it. We don't Our have Charter it. of Rights don't, doesn't have the equivalent, right? No, and people don't understand that. Yeah. People don't get like, no, you, you can't. And, and this whole <laughs> hate speech thing, and it's so stupid. And our, now Trudeau's trying to pass that law for online for hate speech, right? And the way they, it was, this is the, I'll give them credit for this. They're very good at being sneaky. So the way they snuck it in is they were telling people, we're trying to protect kids online victims of molestation like weird online stuff. harms act you're online talking about harms yeah. act so people are like myself included like mm-hmm. fuck yeah yeah i said these- the same thing on my podcast yeah i was like yeah. fuck yeah, let's protect these goddamn kids yeah right but then and then you look at it it, it, it <laughs> that's just the name yes. of the bill but it includes uh, anything that somebody might say that could be offensive or the best is hate speech because there's no actual definition of hate speech because hate speech depending on the person you, it's just speech that you hate. As defined by who, right? The, the government? Then we're really so screwed. It is so tricky. It yeah. is so tricky. That's why normally you have to avoid that. And I like what the Americans do. Is you have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is not without consequence. Because let's say if you go out and you say, I fucking hate Tim Hortons. Just you say, I fucking don't like Tim Hortons. <laughs> then you have a consequence where Tim Hortons is not going to be your sponsor. For example, like, well, you said you fucking hate me, so fuck off. So there's minimal consequences. Then there's bigger consequences. You, you're not allowed to call for the death of someone or the people. Like if you go on a podcast, you're like, you know what we should do? We should kill the gays. I'd be like, bro, you fu- that's insane. But what are you doing? That's, it's people who listen to you are stupid are going to go attack people. So I, that's a limit if you're calling for violence and physical. Anything else, as far as I'm concerned, if you have an hour podcast that talks about how fucking stupid Pantelis is, Fuck that guy, and you're not. Def- you're just saying how stupid and how much you don't like me. You're not saying. Uh, you're not saying like he, he's a rapist. He's a. Mur-. You're not like it's not allegations. You're just mm. talking shit. Yeah. You should be fucking allowed to have a podcast of Absolutely. one hour of talking shit about me. Yeah. Or the prime minister or, or anybody. The, you you're should being critical. Hundred percent. Be. I wouldn't yeah. stop that. I'd be like, there's nothing defamatory. They're saying I'm a fucking dork and they don't like me. They're super allowed to do it. Yeah. If anything, I'll fucking share the clip. They they, they should be allowed to do shit like that because mm-hmm. that's critical. It's not the same level as if you, like right now, you're allowed to say how Justin Trudeau is, a, is an idiot and he's fucking up the country and I don't fucking like him. It's not the equivalent of you coming out here and being like, Justin Trudeau is a child molester. It's like, no, you don't have any proof of that. That's an allegation. Mm-hmm. They're two different things. Yes. You can't group them together. No. You should be allowed to criticize anyone. Yeah. 100%. But the Online Harms Act, I was talking about it several podcasts ago and I said, look, I'm all, I said the same thing. I'm all for protecting kids and children, but I don't believe it. 
No, that's I never believe the the. There's always something behind what they're now doing. Now we know it's the words. Well, it's well the, of course we know. And then you start looking into it and reading up on it, and I'm like, Nah, I'm not for this. You know, I'm all for protecting kids. I'm all even even with porn. Porn is it's not good. If we had, I always say, bad for you. It's, if I had the the level of porn that's out there right now, I always say it. In my teen years, when I was going to high school, I don't think I ever would have lifted up the uh, curtain to my bedroom or left my house, right? Because the dopamine would be in overtime, and we had like National Geographic and and one fucking beta VHS video going around from imagine guy to guy, right? <laughs> Can you imagine? So it's not good. It, and so I get the whole protecting kids when it comes to certain things. I'm not into where they're going to take it. By the way, the porn thing is very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Because there's a whole generation. And I was reading up on this because I had a, a conversation with a, uh, my friend Michelle Forrester. She's a comedian. And we were talking about how college kids, like, uh, so males aren't uh, r- having as much, like a lot lower. They're not having sex as much. By, by like huge numbers so they're staying uh celibate let's say till close to 30 or 27 or whatever which wouldn't happen before it was a different statistic for males young males so when they go to college they were just bagging everything they were, because of porn and they become isolated they just go home and jerk off yeah so what happened is socially a lot of girls now are getting frustrated because they can't sleep with anyone and they can't meet because guys don't really care like i'm gonna go jerk off and then i'm gonna play with my friends so they got so used to being alone that a whole generation now there's women close to 30 who are like i can't date like i'm no people stand me they don't care they're just gonna go watch some porn go play yep. and i was reading about it i was talking to her about it and she was explaining she goes the younger guys that they don't care anymore yeah they it's a whole but i because i'm of that generation right at the end where the internet started to become a thing mm-hmm. you know um, so I like 2007 Facebook came out I had graduated high school in 2005 already so it wasn't yeah. it was right before everything started to become so easily accessible you know cell phones with internet so I don't really have a personal experience in it but apparently college uh, students are living a whole different reality than we did yeah. when we were young and then there's false expectations of what sex and healthy sex yeah, is it fucks with your and head. guys you're watching all these videos it's not how it then, is and then you meet you know <laughs> you're trying to choke her <laughs> like what are you doing and you're doing all this stuff that you know you're you're watching and the girls are like whoa, 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 get out get out of my face right yeah you're, it is. you're absolutely insane because it's not they've normalized a lot of those things so. but what do we do here's the thing that's crazy is what do we do because i'm all for i kids should not have access to hardcore pornography that's insane mm. but what do you do yeah because now they're talking about um like verifying your age for porn which in some of me is like you should find a way to verify it, like in a smarter I, way. Than I just do get the that, box. yeah, but, but I don't like having a database with people's IDs on it. Like fucking Freeway Frank loves milfs. Yeah, like <laughs> I, how did you know? Because I'm against. I don't like databases. I don't like. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm anti-government. Yes, you know. I'm, I'm Me too. Pro, I'm pro-human. Yeah, I'm not pro-collective. I'm I'm very pro the I individual. I'm pro-human too. Humanism, yeah. Because because here's the thing uh, people forget, and I was listening to um, speeches that uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, uh, had love Ayn Rand. Died. Yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm a big Rush fan, so I got introduced to Ayn Rand. I read Anthem. I've been meaning to read it again, but Neil Peart was really into Ayn Rand. So, so I wasn't until uh, I was like, I'm not gonna listen to something broad. Tell me what to think. No, <laughs> but I, I really, really like her. Yeah. Um, like my political ideologies, more and more as I grow older, are starting to align with that. Because I'm starting to realize that you can't save everyone. No. You could give them some if you can't. And I don't like the idea that I have to be responsible for someone else's mistakes. I really don't like that. I'm not talking about your family, your kids. I'm talking about a stranger that I don't know. Somehow, for example, Trudeau. Trudeau deciding that we're part of this cult. Uh, So there's going to be a a carbon tax. Somehow it's going to stop lightning. I don't know how that's going to work. Shit like that. So I have to now contribute to this guy's ideology. Yeah. Why? What are you talking about? That's insane. I'm not contributing to any of this fucking anti-science nonsense. I hate these anti-science people that call themselves science. Science, yeah. I don't know how a tax is going to levy, uh, a levying a tax is going to help it, the climate. Yeah, April 1st is uh, almost here around the corner. It, it's, it's just, to me, it's unfathomable of what we have become as Canadians and how people just sit back, not even like spectators, and watch the show happen before their eyes, but almost like look away. Yeah. And just keep walking down the road and onto the next bus, and eh, I'll go to the next. Like you're, you're not paying attention to what's going on here. Like we have two guys right now sitting down, talking about everything we brought up, right? And we've we've taught we've covered so many things. Are people not having? Because 
I've only met you now twice. Oh, by the way, I love speaking to you. It's good. I could sit down and have a beer with you, and I'm sure talk for ages and yeah. throw in Poseidon and a couple of other interesting characters into that mix, and and talk about so much. It doesn't mean we we you have to agree with everything I say. No, or I have not to at agree all. With everything you say, but. My question is just that. Are people not having these conversations anymore? I think it might just be scary. Like you'll think about, it's easier to think that someone will take it. And I think we've been uh, indoctrinated through TV, through society to think that someone's title dictates their behavior. Therefore, someone's title uh, will dictate how much better they are at something than you, just the title, not their experience. For example, politics. Just because someone has the title of prime minister, mini they're somehow better than you at something, but there's no, there's no prerequisite. For example, prime minister. There's no prerequisite of schooling or anything that will make a, you prime minister. Assistant drama teacher it, and you become the prime minister. Yeah, yeah it doesn't, for, for a lot of stuff. Or people yeah. used to be like this. If you remember the old Italians, because they're like the Greeks, they used to assume, like the bank, working at the bank was the biggest deal. Do you remember this? Yes, of a course. A teller at the bank, yeah. oh, they must be smart. They work at the bank. <laughs> and I'm not saying you're dumb. They handle you money. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying if you work at the bank now, yeah. you know exactly what I mean. You're like, what? I work with idiots. But every job, <laughs> you look at every job, it's filled with idiots. It is. I remember yeah. being in the corporate world and and noticing that being like holy fuck yeah they're mostly morons that just go they'll just repeat what they were told no one thinks they'll keep hitting their head against the wall if you don't tell them to stop and you see this in a lot of different fields and you're like the the title does not dictate either your behavior or your competence mm -hmm. you know you, that's another big thing is we don't talk about competence yeah so it, it, there's a lot of incompetence out there the thing i was talking about this on a, on a former podcast as well on one of my solo casts how Exactly what you just said. There are people that are lawyers, people that are doctors, and we saw it through the last couple of years of what we went through, right? These are doctors. These are people that have studied a long time. They're definitely textbook smart. I know one specific person that is amazing at what he does, and he's, he's, a, he's a lifesaver. He saves people's lives, intricate surgeon. Um, I'm not single-handedly mentioning him, but the point I'm getting at is there are people that are academics, extremely smart at what they do, but then had absolutely no opinion or were very quiet during a certain period we call, yeah. begins with a C and ends with a D because I want this podcast to survive on COVID, damn it. Dude, by the way, talking about that, you, uh, well, dude, I've spoken to, during the whole thing, I've spoken to a lot of doctors at the yeah. time that were like, uh, I don't know what the fuck this is. Like, I don't know if you should get the jab. Like, doctors, but, and too. a lot of people told yeah. me, we can't say it, because there's another a thing. A lot of you, people. One yeah. of the oaths that you swear, as a, I know in Canada, is you also have to go by their norms. Like, you can't just deviate. You can't, your, no. Even if you doubt it. Yes. So, it comes from the top. They tell you this is what's next, this, and you have to adhere. And there's some people that, you know, under the table, like, don't fucking do this. Yeah. But it's, we don't know what the fuck this is. And that's why you get deplatformed, and that's why they ostracize you. Which and is we, crazy. We saw so many people, some, uh, the most legitimate people in their field, like the, we've talked about this on your podcast, the Malones, mm -hmm. so many of the, the ones that were highlighted on, on Rogan's Rogan, podcast dude, that were considered. R yeah. Rogan was attacked. Yeah. For uh, his treatment, he did the same treatment as uh, Tim Dillon, another comic did, yep. as Trump did. It was the hydroxychloroquine, the um, the ivermectin, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the best one, I think, from what I understand, the antibody treatment, because you're, you're helping yourself fight a virus uh, or a flu, whatever the fuck it was. And that some all the rich people were doing that, and they were fine after. And somehow the media got people, regular people, to be like, that's bullshit, don't do it, you're killing people. The dumbest, it's like, you're seeing a Trump who like lives on a diet of cheeseburgers, mm -hmm. surviving, and coke. <laughs> and surviving it in a day or two, yeah, yeah, because they did this to him, and you're screaming against you having access to it. We must be the dumbest generation. You're like, that fat guy, he's healed. I don't want to be healed. It's dangerous. It's so, I was watching and I was like, this is shocking. Yeah. They're attacking Rogan. He's like, yeah, I'm over it over in the day. I did what my doctor told me. Yeah. And I'm over it. And like, look at this guy. It's so dangerous. You have nurses. We don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah. Screaming. It's fucking dangerous. Why is he doing this? Why is he curing himself? You know how fucking insane you have to be to watch rich people, popular people get cured of shit 
and you don't want access to that. Yeah, or at least not ask questions about what is, Why he, is he doing. Can you what? explain what he's doing? And I might be interested. in I it. got mad when Trump yeah. was was uh, w- uh, was diagnosed, mm-hmm. and then he went and did the treatment, and he was out into he was out of the limo saying I'm fucking good or whatever. Yeah. Took his and, mask off. Yeah, and then people were talking against <laughs> it, like you shouldn't do that. It's, this is dangerous for people. Then I was like, hold on a second, you, you're gonna make society believe. They're gonna watch someone who's clearly unhealthy. Are we gonna see Trump is fucking healthy, bro? Well, what is he this guy eating? Yeah. So he's clearly <laughs> unhealthy. Boris Johnson, same yeah. thing. All these fucking people. Uh, Brogan was the only outlier. He's actually healthy, and he did that stuff, and it helped him again. Mm-hmm. I go, so they're telling you, the unhealthy people and the healthy people did this. Bam, we're right back up. And you're because the zombie media told you that's bad, that's bad. You're gonna go out there and just regurgitate, be like, yeah. I don't wanna be. It's for horses. Yeah. Something that's been used billions of times, yeah. uh, billions of times for years on humans. It's for hor- They're so stupid. They're so stu- so. You look at it. You, look at it, you can't save people. They're so fucking dumb. Yeah. When, so- as soon as you started hearing horse dewormer and, and and how about the 450 million people on some you know area of India that had nothing else? They had no they had no jab, so they the Congo, had to take the Congolese. Yeah, they had to take ivermectin and oh everything's okay. And now the narrative changed. <laughs> yeah, now, now it's too, like, well, oh yeah. no, it is good. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. it pissed me out. Or yeah. Fauci, Fauci comes back and says, I don't know why people wore masks and did two meters. That, That's stu- oh, that pissed when me I off. saw him say, yeah. I was like, okay, he's gaslighting <laughs> a planet. When he said, I don't know I why, like, I don't know who told you to do that. Yeah. And they're like, you, you, t- we have videos of you telling us that. He's like, nah, it's fucking stupid. Why would you do that? But, the people that and people were militant. People were yelling when I'm, oh, I know, I know. I remember telling people, "What's yeah. the difference? I'm sitting at a table with no mask. When I get up, you want me to put my mask? You don't see how yeah. dumb this is. Yeah. No, it's the fucking science. And then yeah. now, when the guy who told you to do that tells you that's fucking stupid, I can't believe you did it. You're like, yeah, that's fucking stupid. Now it's fucking stupid. You couldn't use common sense at the time to realize none of this makes any fucking sense. Yeah, the the fact that anybody, not everybody, everyone should have been questioning. Everyone, everyone should have said. At some point, this makes no sense. You're touching it. You're contaminating the mask. You're moving it up. You're moving it down. You're putting it on to go to the washroom. You're putting it on in some places. You're going up certain corridors and following arrows. You're in circles, all eating together outside. It doesn't make guys any sense. are being uh, uh, gr- you know pummeled by security guards on a beach yeah, for we wearing, have, now wearing a, a mask. We have to be uh, oh, kids yeah. swimming practice, yeah. wearing masks in the water, yeah. swimming, water, uh, waterboarding kids because yeah. we're, we're mental. Uh, then you'd, all the small mom and pop shops had to close down. It's fucking dangerous. The only safe store is a Walmart. And then you're inside the Walmart, but no, 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 you can only oh. shop at these sections. Yeah, you can't what? buy certain you items. See, you see that line? The second <laughs> you try to purchase that item, everyone's dying. But none of this made sense. I remember freaking. I go, how yeah. stupid are you people? Yeah. And they're like, no, follow the fire. I'm following the lines. I remember that. I'm following <laughs> the lines. I'm the fucking idiots. And then you wonder why nothing works because you're mostly morons. Yeah. That's why it doesn't work. Yeah. You but, have to question stupid shit. But like we started this conversation, you expect it from the stupid people and the yeah. low IQ people. The majority of people obviously expose themselves not very smart. But how about the people that studied who are doing some amazing things in their in their careers who also just stood there and didn't that to me is the one that I will never understand and I've mentioned it to several people this is psychological there's there's you could read about this it's the and I forget the name bro and I looked into this because I was wondering the same thing it's a, a fear of so you need to belong. One of uh, the inherent traits of humanity is you have to belong to groups. Okay? Yeah. That's why... It's tribalism. It's tribalism. No. That's why they use d- uh, certain groups to separate you and then they pick you from those groups. Yeah. So the group that you're a sub... Like we said before, you're part of the Greek, you're part of the LGBTQ, you're part of the Black Lives you're part of this. Those are your separate subgroups. And in order to get you to fight is the government, you're also part of my group, you're part of my party. And they use you when they need you so you could fight the other people in subgroups, which technically... Your group should be that. We should mm-hmm. all be in the human group, yeah. right? So anyway, but because we want to be part of a group, it's just innate in us. We need it. Uh, getting exiled back in the day was one of the worst things that you could do to someone. So you want to be part of a group. You're very scared to speak out against the group. It's very few people that are going to be like, this is fucking stupid. One guy says it, they beat him down. The next guy says they beat him down. After a certain point, people are just agreeing. They're like, the sky's red. Of course it's red. <laughs> like, But you know if you look up, it's not, no, no, why would I look up? I know it's red. I yeah. believe everyone, we, know, we all know Don't it's look red. up. <laughs> we, and then sometimes you will look up and be like, yep, red. So it's just it's historical. That's, people, that's how people do stupid shit, like uh, Nazis and all that. That's how people Mass fall. psychosis. It's ma- well, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. It's mass formation psychosis. Yeah. 
and, and I see it a lot where people are just scared. You see it in high school too, rumors and all. People are just scared to deviate from the group. They want to be accepted. They want to be accepted, so they do stupid shit. I'm not willing to join the group to do stupid shit. That's why I'm not willing to kill people. Yeah. I'm not going to join anybody's fucking wars. Uh, if it's dumb, I call it out. Like, I tried my best during the pandemic to do whatever I could that made sense to me, but there was some stuff that I just couldn't <laughs> believe people were arguing. I was calling, Fantelis, I was calling it out just before we knew each other every day. I was doing live Instagrams every day calling it out, and I, and I realized very quickly, like within hours of doing it, how canceled I was going to be. Yeah, and I never got so, so much hate in my life because people get angry because yeah. they don't like you calling it out because they know they fell for a lot of stupid shit yeah so they're like i can't be an idiot this guy must be a fucking idiot but now <laughs> but what's crazy is you, so i'm willing to concede when i'm wrong i'll be like oh fuck i had that wrong me too 100 percent. i've noticed that with all the stuff coming out now all the stuff that we were correct on oh uh, you see this no one's come be like, oh, I'm sorry, I overreacted. I'm sorry, I called Nobody's, you that. No, but them, yeah. they're like, Ugh, they put their heads on like, no, it's yeah. still real to me. I've had not one person that was completely against what I said. Maybe one, okay, maybe one, maybe two, say, come out and say, man, I was duped, you know? But who was I talking to about? Oh, Sam Adamo. Yeah, so Sam. I met Sam Adamo at your podcast when I recorded that day. And then I went on his podcast a couple of weeks ago and on Sam Adamo's podcast I basically mentioned this right that we were we were okay we stood up we we spoke we said what we said and we were basically vilified right we were bullied and we have every right now Pantelis to come on and say we were right you were wrong. And I said this to Sam. He said, why aren't you doing more of the na 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 No, nah, And I, you know what I said? Helping me. Because, because you would think, but, and I said, I don't have to. Yeah, and, he, and he goes, why not? And I, and I, and I said, because I won. <laughs> wait, but wait, it's not because I always have to win, because I've lost many times. By the way, we didn't okay. win, we lost, just yeah. so you know. Oh, yeah. like, we all lost. Yeah, yeah, we all lost. We but all I, lost But what I mean, we have all lost collectively. But what I meant was, what do I have to say to prove to myself that they don't already know? They all know. Okay, even the dumb ones, they know. So I'm just going to be quiet, yeah. not say anything, take the, you know, the high road, and that's it. What else is there to say about it, right? Or, but I love the fact that we're talking about this now because a lot of people are scared to bring this up again, right? To, yeah, they, to, well, they look at it, it as up, a yeah. rehash, right? Oh, yeah. you're re but it's not a rehash because when you go through the torment that so many people had to go through and people, psychologically... You weren't allowed to visit your parents yeah, man, it and messes homes, with you. in hospitals. It messes they with They really you. fucked. Yeah. They brought everyone down they did. to their lowest psychological point. And then as soon as we're coming back out of it, there's new wars. Yeah, what's the next thing? Exactly. And so, then the uh, next thing was Ukraine, and then we didn't hear about the pandemic anymore, right? No, and it's, 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 it, it's something replacing something else. And then uh, Israel and uh, Palestine, and then there'll be something else coming your way. Uh, well, there is, um, we do have... Um, a uh, solar eclipse in a couple of weeks. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Uh, but that's completely different. But who knows how... Oh, that's what I wanted to mention regarding the solar eclipse. When I... Okay. So I'm a lot older than you. In 1979, I was in elementary when the last solar eclipse seen in Canada came over Montreal. Okay. We had glasses. We were in school. We were told... If you're not wearing sunglasses, you cannot look up. I remember. And I remember I re them saying that when I was a kid too. They said that you'll go blind. Is that true? It's yes, you will go blind. Okay. Yes, and then this one is the one. This is the full solar eclipse that we'll be experiencing. Is this the dangerous or no? Very dangerous because the last time I experienced it in my lifetime, get this, was 1979 when it happened, and I remember them telling us we have to all participate and do this. And look, the next one will be in April of 2024 and i remember we looked at each other because we we're all the same age and the same we're gonna be dead and, I, and we said i'm gonna be i guess i'm gonna say my age 53 years old when the next one hits if we're still alive yeah. and we had that conversation now here it is it's pretty wild to think that all those years have gone by and now the solar eclipse is you know coming but the thing that i wanted to mention is we were in school and they and we were told don't don't, Don't look, look up, up, right? I but remember the, without putting on your glasses, we had glasses at the time. But now, school is getting a ped day. 
I really okay. That's weird like to me too. I don't know why. Because we live in a snowflake society. But is it because it's dangerous to? That's why they're not taking. Well, it, they don't want to be responsible. But we. But it was dangerous. No, no, when no. We I'm went. saying is yeah. that the reason they're getting? That is the exact reason. Yes. I don't know when this happened, but I remember I was in elementary school. I don't know what. I remember there was an eclipse, and they told us when we we're walking out. I remember that there's an eclipse at this time, three o'clock or whatever. And I remember them saying, "Don't look up. It's da- you'll go blind." Yes. And I remember trying. To see the sun, like you yeah, know, I remember. Me too. Yeah, well, there were kid. other ones. That's the thing. But at the level of this one, this yeah, is yeah, a yeah. full solar eclipse. Me, there hasn't have been, been one. It was in the nineties, right? Yeah. When I was in elementary. Yeah. But I remember, I remember that as a kid, and yeah. and never understanding because it happened once, and then never understanding. Wait, why can't I look up? Like, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna burn? Mm-hmm. Am I am I gonna see white? It was, but you don't want to take the full risk yeah. and all that. There was a partial one when Trump was president. You remember and that? He and he went and he looked. <laughs> And, like, what's going and, on? They, and they destroyed him in the yeah, media. He's for like, I'm not court. falling for yeah. this scam. Yeah. <laughs> this is a scam too. Oh man, it's unreal. Okay, before I forget, so you have the Pantelis uh, French cast. You have the Pantelis podcast, Two Drink Minimum, The Intellectuals. There's the Morning Show, uh, Ted Bird and um, uh, Terry DeMonte. Terry DeMonte. They do standing by the podcast. We also have. Uh, I'm going to be on that one. Yeah, you're going to love that one. Yep. It's, it's a good time. There's uh, Is It Me with Michelle Forrester. Uh, I have a lot of uh, other podcasts in the works too. So yeah. And you're doing, can you mention this whole, uh, you're going oh, on a five-week yeah. uh, tour? Yeah, doing starting some five, yeah, I'm going to be emceeing a burlesque show. Uh, it's a, a Star Wars themed parody. It's uh, The Empire Strips Back. Uh, I think most tickets are already sold out in Montreal, so it's going to be too late for people to even buy ones. But it's going to be a fun show. I went to Toronto to check it out and learn how to dance and sing and all that. So people are in for something. Now, you did some acting back in the day, right? Yeah. Uh, theater, but you never, you can't <laughs> sing. Can you sing <laughs> at all? Like, do you know? No, not at all. <laughs> it was a good gig, it's so awful. you took it. It's awful. Why not? Pantelis, it was fantastic having you on the Drive-By Podcast. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy and continued success with uh, your company, Pantelis Comedy on YouTube as well. You can check out all the videos and everywhere podcasts are heard. He's literally everywhere with everyone. And I wish you the best, man. Thank Thank you you so much. All the best. I'm going to do, let's do one of those. We're not shaking hands anymore. Yeah, we're shaking Left hand? Left, no, that's, that's why. That's, that's why. Is that Greek? Because you had yeah, your left out. That's why I was like, I'm not going to shake his left Thanks, hand. Thanks, bud. Appreciate Later. it. Episode 177 of the Drive-By Podcast with Pantelis. Enjoyed having him here. It was a great time, and I always have. Les Delis Lafrenet available. Of course, the box now is empty. Well, it's, it's empty with a glass. Who knows what we were drinking? It's Lidilis. <laughs> it's product placement because the placement has gone. Yes, the placement is our stomachs. Check out Lidilis Lafrenet. Simplement délicieux. Five Montreal locations. St. Leonard, Rosemere, Point Claire, Montreal West. And my home location in Brossard. Voted top bakery and pastry shop in Montreal. And for a reason, they're number one. Lidilis Lafrenet. Baton Rouge, Grill House and Bar. Terrasse, as we say here in Quebec. Patio, everywhere else in Canada. Already open at the Vaudreuil location. Check them out. 29 Montreal locations. A brand new one. Number 30 coming to La Salle. Of course, the hub in downtown Montreal. The most popular on St. Catherine. When you're doing things around the city, you could check out Baton Rouge. uh, Right near um, Complex des Jardins. At Complex des Jardins, as a matter of fact. Another popular one. The one on DeCarry. They're all popular because they're all that mouthwatery. And great tasting ribs, hamburgers, signature spinach dip, their Rickards French onion soup I had the other day, which was fantastic or perfect for this time of year, their creamy potato soup. It's Baton Rouge Grill House and Bar. This is the drive by with Freeway Frank. Watch all episodes of The Drive-By on YouTube. Listen in on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, Podbean, and tune in.